Hallelujah. You guys look excited today? Yeah. You don't sound like it. I am. When Gabriel's up here talking, everybody's all in. I get up here and fall, fall asleep. It's like, oh, it's good. It's time to take a nap. Pastor's going to preach. <laughs> well, tonight, this morning rather, I've got uh, my best friend. He's going to preach. He's here today and uh, just a, such a good guy. He's got an awesome wife and their kids and grandkids, just wonderful people. He is uh, a, a missionary and he's a pastor in the States, a missionary in Africa. So half the year he's in Africa, half the year he's in America. And he received this calling quite a while back, but it came to fruition about seven years ago. And he went into Katali, and God has just done a miraculous work in his ministry. Amen. And they're exploding in Africa. Amen. It's just astounding. God's given him strategy in how to bring together people, how to draw, how to touch nations, not just Kenya, but other nations. He's just got so much opportunity that God's given to him that the Lord has entrusted him with. And him and I have been friends for years. And when we first met, it was first love. He fell in love with me. And I said, I'm married, brother. But we became best friends immediately. It just clicked because he has my heart, I have his. We're just good buddies. He's a great man, very insightful. His daughter calls him the general because that's the way he operates in Africa. And just a powerhouse of a minister operates in the gift of miracles, healings. He's an apostle. He walks in all of these arenas, prophetic word of knowledge, just flows in the gifts. And I just am so excited to have him here. And uh, I just want to give a powerful welcome to the man of God, Pastor Coney Orozco. Church is a family. Yeah. 
You know, I love uh, your pastor and Josie and Roman and Gabriel and the kids. And uh, it's just like my family. And we just have a great time. Last night, uh, we were sitting there and uh, they're all mocking Pastor Mike. Hallelujah, because he was drinking Maxwell House coffee and getting heartburn. <laughs> and we were telling him, just spend 47 cents more that he won't get heartburn anymore. We just had a great time as a family. And if I'm going to minister today, but I want to come from that perspective. Because uh, American families are really messed up. Not all. But I don't think what our culture produces, the environment that it produces, is something that is beneficial to the family. One of the things that uh, makes me really upset is phones. Uh, and apps. And games. Don't get mad at me. I'm just an old, an old dude. Where these fat thumbs can't text anything. So I get frustrated and I just, why don't you just call me? And we can communicate. And then I, clarity. So our culture has created uh, this environment. Uh, you get on the airplane. And I like to chit chat with people. So I got on an airplane, the first thing they do is pull out their phones. And they're looking straight at their phones. I mean, I'm so close to them, you know, I could spit on them. You know? <laughs> but the phones save their lives from talking to somebody new. One guy watched the movie, the other one was looking at some things, you know, and I was sitting in the middle flying up to Denver. So I want to challenge you today. Some of you have been to church, came for a while, and you come occasionally. Some of you have been in church for a long time, and you're blessed. You have family, friends. You get in trouble, the church just responds to you. Really, the church responds to everybody whether you're here all the time or not here. That's right. So turn with me, and I'll read some scriptures to you. How many want to make heaven? Amen. And my whole goal at this age of my life is I want to make heaven. I'm 69 years old. Everybody says I look like 50. Amen? Yeah. And... From start to finish, your life. Born into a family, grow up, could have been good or bad, whatever the issues are. When I came to God, I was broken. And all I wanted was a family. My instincts told me that a family is the greatest thing in the world even though I came from a broken family. And so when I married my wife, my expectation was I was going to marry her until I die. Yeah. I was going to have children, and my children were going to have children. Yeah. And then I got saved when I was 24. And God began to open my eyes <coughs> to really the purpose and the plan of my life. I became a preacher at 30 years old. And in reality, what transpired in my life is that I'm at the end of my race. Every one of you have a race. Yeah. You start, and you must cross the finish line of life. I sat at a man's bedside, older man. Well, he wasn't really old when he died of cancer like 62. He was a good friend of mine. So I went to his house when I found out he had cancer. Went to him, walked in the door. 
Now this is a grown man, falls on his knees in front of me. Begins to cry, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I have to finish my race. Obviously, we don't determine the day that we can die. But what he said to me made such an impact in my life. And I've done that many times with people that they regret how they live their life. And you don't have to do that. You say amen? amen? You don't have to regret your finish line. In fact, you ought to make the finish line your goal and purpose of the scriptural truths of what God says about your life. And when you do that, what happens is that you begin to set your pace. Uh, last night I was talking to some brothers and I told the brothers, I'm a choo-choo train. I, I just keep going, you know. And I've been through some trials in Christianity. I just keep going, you know. What are you? Are you emotional? Do you lose your goal and purpose of why you're a Christian in trials and tribulations? I hope today I can help you, okay? There's a tremendous word, and we'll read it to you. It's in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, uh, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have uh, tasted the Lord in graciousness, come to him as living stones, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, precious. You also a living stone. He's just going to give us an understanding of what our life is. You're a living stone, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contains in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by, by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, and to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone, the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. They stumbled being disobedient to the word, which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who calls you out of darkness into marvelous light. The words were not a people, but now a people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, this scripture comes out of an Old Testament scripture. And it's a scripture given to the children of Israel. And they were in slavery in Egypt. Okay? They were coming out of slavery. I believe this is the Christian life. A picture of us, a Christian, or a, a, an unbeliever coming to Christ is a picture that the world in which we live is that we're in bondage to sin. I remember you're in bondage to sin. And you're in slavery to sin. And so this is the picture. And he speaks here and he proclaims what is going to happen to a human heart, a human life. He said the mercy of God is going to come. And as the mercy of God comes, what transpires, you're going to receive something from God. A prophetic word saying this is what your life's going to be. You're going to become a king and a priest. Now, our culture doesn't understand that. How many understand what a king is? Unless you live in England. A king and a queen. No, we don't understand what a king and a queen is. These people understood what a king was. The place that 
Uh, in the culture, what a king means, he was the high authority. He was the authority. He was in a great position of power. <coughs> the children of Israel understood what a priest was. He was the one that ministered to God. They had the temple. Not at this point, but they were going to have the temple. The priest is going to be the ones that carried out God's instruction to how to worship. How to be a, a believer in God. Amen. And so the whole point of you becoming a Christian is to become a king and a priest. Say that. King and a priest. King and a priest. King and a priest. That is what God has called you to become. Amen. That's the whole purpose of you being a Christian. See, a lot of people come and be a Christian, but they're... Uh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So in the book of uh, Exodus 19, verse 6 says, And you shall be to me a king, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And then... Uh, in 2 Corinthians it says these words he said for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of power may be of God and not of us so when you're born again automatically he takes you in to the power of of who he is. The power of God. Amen. How many remember the day that you got saved? Yes. Now, I was a Catholic. I'm not going to offend anybody. But I used to go to that confessional box, man. And I used to say those prayers. I'd get on my knees. Stand up. Get on my knees. Do the sign of the cross. Get the water. Dip it. Still felt like a sinner. Amen. Right. Year after Amen. year, time and time again. And I remember the day I prayed the prayer of repentance and asked to be saved. Yes. Amen. Blood washing. I didn't understand about the blood covenant, did anything. But the Bible says you must be born again. Amen. Amen. When I became born again, that was my turning point of me beginning a new life and God giving me the desires of my heart. You are a treasure in earthen vessels. We're made of clay, came from the dust, and dust we shall return. Your flesh will be gone, but your spirit will live forever. You have a purpose. And God has a plan for your life. Amen. Amen. Christianity can get ugly. For some of you that have been around, you wrestle with that. Christianity is not this consistent to me. It's like just going straight up. And you just continue climbing as a Christian. And there's mountains to climb, but you speak to them. There's valleys. That's where God meets you. But you must come to a place of understanding who you are in Christ. And you must become this consistent believer and place yourself in the position that God has called you to be. He says here in this word, desire the word as newborn babes in Christ. Now, I know Gabe, Gabe uh, Roman. I know those guys. I didn't know them when they were crawling. They brought their kids over. And the, the, one of the baby was trying to crawl. He was standing on his feet, sticking his butt up in the air. But he wasn't going anyplace. And everybody's going, yay! Amen. Everybody. Yep. How cute. She get up, do, 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 then fall over. That's a babe to me, isn't it? 
<laughs> Can you imagine Roman and Gabriel standing up here on their four knees going, here, here, here. Well, that's some of you Christians. You're still sucking on the bottle. If you don't say amen, I will. Amen. It's true. Don't you expect a child to grow up, most of all, get potty trained? Hallelujah. Amen. Start walking. And as you watch them grow up, you know, go through the adolescent, get to the place. In some place, you know, I think Roman was telling me they were living in the house and the rules that they had to go get a job or go to college. And both of them said they couldn't spell college. So obviously they had to get a job. Amen. So there was an expectation of them to grow up, get a job, and start making some money. That's right. Don't you expect that in your family? Yeah. Amen. Come on now. Amen. You see it with your eyes, you look at it, and you see a family structure, and you have this expectation of your own children. And when your children are a burden to you when they're 35, it vexes you. And you say, come on, just grow up. <coughs> I've had the great privilege of two of my children living with me for a year. The last one has four kids. I already paid the price. So what I did is said, you can come into my house and I have this door into my room and I said, that's where you stop. This is my room. You can have the whole house. Guess what happened? My wife. My wife. I said, what are you doing? This is my refuge. That's all I have left. That's it. It's done. And you let him in. So both of them are sitting there on my bed, pushing me off. So I had to go sit in the chair. So when they walk up to my chair, I said, get away. But you understand, church, in the natural process of your life, you expect certain things, even out of yourself and out of your children. That's normal. But we're in a culture that is not, doesn't have the revelation of God. And you have kids that, that are 40 years old, drug addicts. You have people that are Christians getting divorces. And it's a heartbreak. See, you are a king and you are a priest. You must go from milk, milk to bread. And from bread to meat. How many like a good steak in here? Yeah. I know they're selling burritos when I couldn't eat one because I burp. <laughs> Me, you must grow in the Word of God to be. God's made provision for us to be spiritual, to grow up and be men and women of God. Amen. Bye. The end of your life should be the greatest time in your life. This is the greatest time in my life. I am more fruitful than ever in all of my Christianity. I am stronger in my faith than I ever have been. And I've been through some things. When my wife and I chose to go to Africa, we retired. Early. We lost half our income. Now the American dream is what? Come on now. Buy a trailer, or whatever you call these things. 
Yeah, yeah, travel America. Nothing wrong with it. But we decided to give our lives again to the gospel. And when we got there, it was overwhelming. No hope. Absolutely none. And we looked at each other. And we're trying to figure out how the gospel was going to work. He's talking to people that have no hope. You know that? No jobs. No opportunity. They eat one meal a day. Yes. You know what that consists of? Corn masa in a ball with spinach. They eat chicken once a year. Come on now. This is their lot. Mortality rate in children is like three out of five. People every week die. Every week. And I am no overwhelmed. I'm an American. If I don't sit down to a good meal, I get ticked off. Come on. And I'm here. I'm going to give them something. I got something to offer these people. And over a period of time, I begin to understand the power of the gospel. Is to change a human life and make a family. Yes. Did you hear me? Yes. See, you're surrounded with we are surrounded with materialism. Yes. Come on. And some of your goals and purposes are is to reach, your goal is to reach and grab this materialism, and it's gonna bring contentment. And in the re reality, a rich man. Or a rich woman, or a person that has anything they obtained out of materialism, never satisfies. Come on, church. Come on. I'm with you. I'm an American, true and true. But something that must occur in a human life is when you realize the time in which you live, the culture in which you live, the gospel that's 2,000 years old is still relevant to the day in which you and I live. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter where you're at, whether you're in Africa or here, or you're in China or Russia, doesn't make any difference. The gospel works. Amen. It's true. God wants to make a family. A man that loves his wife, a wife that submitted to his husband, and all the women said, Amen. Thank you, Josie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just have to teach on submission. That's not, I just want to stir you up. Amen. The reality is, is that he wants to take your life and put you in a position where you are a queen or a king and you're a priest unto God. That is so profound. I'll be honest with you. I really believe that's where I live. I am blessed. Amen. I am blessed. I'm blessed, blessed, blessed. Amen. I want to do something. I really believe it's important to what God is saying. Everybody knows the scripture. You, you, you use it continually. It's in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, there, brethren, by the mercies of, of God, that you present your body living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Yes. Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, to think, but to think soberly, and God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Even God gives us our faith. The reason you got any faith at all is because God's given it to you. 
And then he says, don't think of yourself more highly than you are. Now, I'm not even going to deal with the first two verses. But this is what's wrong with us. It's called P-R-I-D. Come on. P-R-I-D. is a spelling test. Pride. We get saved. We get converted. God touches our lives. We are so thankful and grateful. Then the years began to count. Bam, bam, bam. Family, children come into play. Brothers and sisters, relatives, things happen that come into play. And because we're Americans, our mentality is to think that we're going to live in a perfect world. we got the best health care in the world, but yet people die. People get sick. It disturbs us. And you have to work that through in your life as a Christian. You have to go to your God, get on your knees, and remember how you got saved. You know why I say that? Because that is the reference point of your humility. Your reference point of your humility, when you got on your knees, you said He was God. Amen. Yes. You said He was Lord. Yes. You bowed your knee. You had no answers, but now you're a theologian. Come on. <coughs> Hallelujah. I work with a group of people that cannot read. Yes. Illiterate. They don't have no Bibles. How many of you got? Come on. They have no Bibles. I got to tell the story. This is the greatest story in the world. Your pastor was preaching. Preaches, preaching the Word. Preaches the Word. People out there go. They begin to clap. Man, let's go. They go. He preaches another word, they go. And I was going, what are they doing? They're hearing the word. It's going into their hearts. And it's washing them. Amen. Because they're illiterate. They don't have a Bible. Faith comes by, hearing. and hearing by, so as they were going, Mike began to go back and clap to them. The whole sermon was them clapping and Pastor Mike clapping. And the Word of God was washing them, because that's the only way they're going to get the Word of God. They're not going to go to some app. They don't have Bibles on their phone. But they heard the Spirit of God. You remember when you got saved? You heard the Spirit of God. Yes. Remember when you heard the Word and just kept watching you and watching you and watching? And you were clapping. Amen. You were rejoicing. Yes. You were thanking God that He saved you. Yes. But you became an American. <laughs> We got to go back, push our culture away, yes. and become kings and priests. Yes. 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 He says to find the perfect will of God. That's what that scripture says. It means to complete. Your walk, you present your body a living sacrifice, which is a reasonable service. All those are spiritual challenges all the time. But here is the decree of that scripture that you find the will of God and you embrace it for everything that you do as a Christian. 
You eat strong meat when it's time to eat meat. Hallelujah. You get down on your knees and say, All right, God, bring me a ribeye. Hallelujah. Bring me the meat that I need to deal with the circumstances I deal with. Then you get up off your knees and you act like a king and you act like a priest. You're too big for Pastor Mike to change your diapers. It'd be embarrassing. You missed a good place to say amen. Amen. You're too big. God's not even. Huh? I, oh, I got a bad picture. I see some people having a milk bottle in their mouths. No, no milk bottles. You see where you're at in Christianity? You should be coming to the place in your faith. I'm talking about all the Christians. Where you, literally, in the authority of God, begin to live the dominion Amen. here on earth. Your children and your children's children. Now, I have 14 grandkids, and I have three children. Then I have a church in America, and then I have a church in Africa, and then I have 60 pastors that I minister to. That's my call. What's your call? I can't do all that. He does it, and I let him do it through me. Yes. I sit in authority as a believer. Your pastor gave me this, uh, I can't even live up to what he said. I'm just a dad and a husband who loves his wife and kids. I went to Africa. I was telling somebody, they call me dad there. I didn't tell them to call me dad. But that's how I minister, you know? They like people that are bald and gray-headed because wisdom comes. Amen. And the reality is wisdom should come from your life at a certain place when you cross over from yes. bread to meat. Where wisdom comes out of your life. Yes. Amen. Say amen. amen. So when I put this sermon together, God gave me this illustration. Cain and Abel. God, I don't want to use that illustration. Cain and Abel. How many know the Cain and Abel story? You know the story? It's pretty heavy. It's in the Bible, though, right? Are you ready? Give me a little encouragement and say, are you ready? Amen? Yeah. Yeah. You still with me? Yeah. I'm almost done. Abel brought, Abel also, Genesis 4, 8, uh, Abel also brought the firstborn of the flock, their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain's offering. Cain, excuse me, was very angry. And his countenance fell. I want you to take note. He was very angry. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? He said, If you do well, will you not be accepted? Now get this verse. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Cain is being talked to by God. And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. And its desire is for you and me. When you don't do well, the devil comes. I said he comes. He's a master. And he just lays it right at your doorstep. And then he says, but you should rule over. Remember, the perfect will of God is to finish. 
the complete. Kings and priests finish. They complete. Now, Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is, is Abel, your brother? And he says, I do not know. Am I, brothers, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother, blood cries out to me from the ground. Here's the amazing thing about Christianity. People don't think. Now listen. Listen very closely. You don't think of yourself important to the king. Whether you serve God or whether you don't serve him. Or how you serve him. Take a passive attitude about your calling and what God's called you to be. You live a life unto yourself, me, myself, and I. But you have to understand the church functions as a body, and I'm only one member. I could be a big toll in the church here. You know, there is the church, and there is a church. The big church is all the church of God all over the world. Now, I'm, I affect the world, so I'm in the big church. Plus, I have a church. So I consider myself a big toe. Okay? And to say I was the heart, and to say I was the liver, pancreas, I said I was the big toe. I was at the bottom of the bottom. That's how I feel. And this is the amazing thing about my thinking about Christianity. I love being the big toe. Amen. Amen. Without your toes, you can't balance yourself. Amen. Amen. That's just my thought. Without you, the body doesn't work. Say that. Without me, Without me the body doesn't work. Kevin, I would not have, like to have you elbow today. You know, I'm getting older, so sometimes I lay on my elbow all night and I get up in the morning my arm's like this. And I'm slapping that thing to get blood back in. But everybody, say everybody, everybody. is important. important. You know how I became a good father? By being in church. I watched my pastor be a pastor to the sheep. And I was so excited about him and becoming my friend that I would have coffee with him to pick his brain about how to be a Christian. And then I began to grow. There's a big demon in the world called anger. Cain brought his sacrifice to God. Now listen to me. He brought a sacrifice, but it was on his terms. That's how most people serve God. The sacrifice that people bring to God was what he produced in the fruit of the field. And God says, I want a blood sacrifice. And Abel, Abel goes, amen, no problem, blood sacrifice. Everybody say blood sacrifice. Blood sacrifice. Why? The only thing that's going to get you to heaven yes. is the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ain't your good works. Amen. It's not the fruit of your field. It's not how many souls you win. It's not what you do for the king. Is that you were blood bought. Yeah. You remember? Amen. You remember when you were on your knees crying, I was blood bought, and you felt him blood wash you from the top of your head to the tip of your toe. Come on. Woo! You man, you started living life. Oh, you go, God, you're alive, and I am free. I'm not a slave any longer. Come on. Yeah. And then you're humility, you just kept eating the milk, and then you started eating bread, 
and you eat a little bit of meat once in a while, you start growing in the grace of God. As you grew in the grace of God, you know, my wife uh, used to just deal with me about my anger. And I couldn't even put it together. You know, that's how dumb I was. I thought that was normal. That was my culture. My dad was angry. His dad was angry. You know, Coney Jr. is going to be angry. Until I got saved. Amen. And God said, no. You're going to love. So you can be loved. My testimony to my children is I have, I don't walk in that any longer and I walk in love and I impart love from God to them. Amen. Amen. And it saves them. Yes. When I got to Africa, I just started loving people. Yes. No heavy, none whatsoever. Just started loving them and watching God change them. Watch God bring hope where there was no hope. Watching the power of the blood come from his throne into their lives and literally wash them and save them by the hundreds. We work with a group of people that live in the middle of the desert. Just like in the Old Testament. Water holes are 25 miles from where they live. No schools. Nothing. They lived that way for thousands of years, and God sent us to preach the gospel to them. Amen. 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 If you would ask me, I would have laughed at you. Anyway, the whole point is that these people are just human beings like you and I. Amen. And they need the blood of Jesus as much as you and I need the blood of Jesus. Amen. It's the problem that you put too much between you and God. In the world. Too much between you and God. Your children can be in front of God. Your job can be in front of God. Hello. Amen. If you're going to stone anybody, stone Pastor Mike because he brought <laughs> Whatever is between you and God. You need to remove it today. Come on. Come on. Whatever makes you angry, you need to remove it today. That's right. Amen. Because sin lies at your door. That's right. And you must rule over that sin. Amen. And you can. You can. You can. You yes. can. Yes. Because of the power of the blood. And when God deals with you and says, bring a blood sacrifice, you bring a blood sacrifice today. Every day, I bring a blood sacrifice, and his name is Jesus. Yes. Every crisis, I bring a blood sacrifice, and his name is Jesus. Every money problem, I bring a sacrifice, and his name is Jesus. And I apply it, and it works. Stand with me, would you? I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. I bless your love and your grace. Your mercy. Close your eyes. Really, really close your eyes. Feel the love of God. He's not condemning us. He's setting us free. He's going to heal you today. Set you free. Change the course. Put you on the path, straight and narrow. He's going to heal you. Again. He's going to set you free again. He paid the ultimate price. I want you to submit to him now. I want you to say the blood of Jesus. Say it again. The blood of Jesus. Real loud. The blood of Jesus. Sets me free. 
Just do it one more time. The blood of Jesus sets you free. There you go. There you go. You just delivered somebody from anger. Put it in perspective. Stay under the blood now. Stay under it in your heart, in your mind. He's cleansing you. Circumstances that you face, the power of the blood, it's going to set you free. You've got authority. You have authority over demons, principalities, and powers. You have. Because you are a king and a priest. Before I just go any further, I just really feel there's some people that came today and you came to a church. And you came because you had a need in your heart for your life, a need in your heart for your family. And you want to know Jesus. That's how we start. We start, you must be born again. You want to know Jesus? You want to make him Lord of your life? Accept him as the atonement for your sin. Everybody has to admit that you've sinned against God. And you're here today and you want to put your hand up and say, Pastor, I want prayer. I want, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I just feel this is really important first. And I'm going to deal with the others. Anybody at all, just anybody will pray with me. I want to be saved. I want to know what it means to know God. I want to know what it means. Sin's forgiven. Anybody at all? Okay. A church that said Abel had greater faith than Cain. Let God move you in your faith. Right now, move in that dimension of faith. But I want you to admit before God, not the people, that you've been taking Cain's sacrifices to God. This is hard, but it'll set you free. You're going to put your hand up and say, Pastor, I need prayer. I need prayer so I can stop this in my life. God bless you. Others, God bless you. Others, others, God bless you. Amen. It's good to repent. Amen. It's good to repent. Oh, remember when you got saved? It's good to repent. It's good to get blood washed. Here's what we're going to do. And then I'm going to do one more thing after that. If you lifted your hand, would you come up here? I want to pray for you. This is really important. I just think it's the timing for your life. Don't sit there in anger. Come on. Step out. 